Okay, hello class. In this video, um, I forgot to hit record in class today, which is 10 21 um, So I'm going to go ahead and go over these examples again. We did cover them in class, but um, I was not recording. So you see everything already all written out. All solutions are there. I'm just going to kind of voice over what was going on. Um, and then that way I can post this video for those that missed class today. So for um, the first thing I, I addressed in class was that there was a question in one of the discussions about the difference between a sequence versus a series. And I just wanted to kind of point that out here on the side. I said that a sequence is this, literally a list of terms. So you usually separate them with a comma versus a series is the sum of the terms. So there's no commas in between the terms. You're actually putting plus signs and you're going to eventually add these things together. Okay, so again, a series is the sum of the terms and a sequence is just the terms in list form, okay? And normally they give you a formula like how to come up with those terms. And so that's essentially what they've given me here. So this represents the term. So this is the nth term represented by this. So if I wanted to find the first term, essentially the n would become a one. And so I literally plugged in one here for ends and then did the computations and got 24. Similarly, if I wanted to find the second term, that means I'm replacing the n with the two. And so I'm plugging in two there and there and then using the calculator to ca compute that value. The third term would plug in three for n, the fourth term you'd plug in four for n, and the fifth term you'd plug in five for n. And then once I use the calculator to get all of these values, um, the sequence is just listing the values in order. So the first one had to be 24, the second one had to be 73 over four, the third one had to be 152 over nine, actually, yeah. And then the last, the fourth one had to be 261 over 16, and the last term had to be positive 16. I just couldn't squeeze it over here on the page, okay? Um, if it were a series, or if they had told me to find the sum of the first five terms, then I would have been adding all of the terms together, and I would have gotten the sum, which would have been whatever the answer is for um, this summation, okay? Um, now, I did kind of also briefly mention in the um, class, and I will minimize this for just a minute. Um, we talked about the um, series tests for convergence and kind of like the breakdown of what all will happen. So this is essentially the note sheet that you'll be given on your test. Um, that's a bad, there we go, there's a better image of it. So this will be what you're given on the test. And so in 9.2, we do talk about the divergence formula, how if you don't get zero when you take the limit of this um, nth term, if you don't get zero, then the series automatically diverges. But if you do get zero, it's inconclusive. You'd have to do another test to find out whether or not it actually converges or diverges. Um, and then in 9.2, we actually talk about the geometric test. 9.3, we'll eventually talk about the p-test and the integral test. 9.4, we'll talk about the two comparison tests. These are not my favorite. And if I have to pick one, I'm going to pick the bottom one. But I will explain those when we get to 9.4. Um, 9.5 is going to be the alternating series test. And 9.6 is going to be the ratio and the root test. Okay. And then um, after that, we're going to actually use those series to like define Maclaurin series and, and Taylor series and things like that, which are the 9.7, 9.8, 9.9, 9.10 situations. Okay. So um, there's a lot in this chapter, but it's not too, too bad. And this, this chart will be super useful for us. Um, right now we're just doing 9.1, so we're just talking about sequences, um, but when we get to the series, which is the rest of chapter 9, um, we will talk about these different tests, okay? Now, when we get to the ratio test, um, there's another graph, another um, box, I think it's, I don't know if it's this box.
Um, but there's another box that kind of tells you like when to use the tests. Um, I'm trying to figure it out. But the one that will happen a lot is um, is the ratio test. And usually use this one. I think this is the chart that I give you. Um, normally, when we have this one with the ratio test, it usually re involves the factorials. But notice that you're going to have to have factorials in the top and then factorials in the bottom. And so we needed to know how to reduce factorials, which is why in 9.1, in the introduction of everything, they do try to get us to simplify some ratio of factorials, okay? And so I went ahead and I described what a factorial meant. It means if you have a number factorial, you have to take that number times every lesser whole number than the one you started with. So if I were taking six factorial, it would be six itself. And then the next lesser whole number would be five. The next lesser whole number would be four, then three, then two, then one. And it goes all the way until you get to one, okay? Um, and so then you can also choose to chop off parts of your factorial. So if you do write it all, expand it off, expand it out, um, notice that if you were to look at four, three, two, one, that itself is defined as four factorial. I could have also done five, four, three, two, one, which would have de been defined as five factorial. Okay. Um, you will cut it off and write it as a factorial, however, it seems convenient. Okay. So, for instance, if I were trying to simplify seven factorial over five factorial, um, Seven would be seven times six times five, four, three, two, one. But instead of writing five, four, three, two, one, I just wrote factorial because at the bottom you have five factorial and then those could cancel out. Like the fives, the fours, the threes, the twos, the ones, each would even individually cancel out. So you could just cancel out the whole factorial, leaving me with just seven times six. And so you do get 42. Now you can type something like this in your calculator and it'll give you 42 but you can't type something like this in the calculator, excuse me, um, with ends in there, with variables in there, because your calculator uh, programs variables to be equivalent to certain numbers. And whatever the calculator has been programmed for in, that's the number that it's going to plug in. So if you're just trying to find a general answer, not a specific answer for a specific in, then you definitely cannot use the calculator to simplify this, okay? And when we get to the ratio test, you won't be using the calculator to simplify them. So we just had to figure out which one of these two were bigger. Was the numerator bigger? Was the denominator bigger? So that way we could write it out and expand it and then leave the other one the same so they would cancel, okay? Kind of like with the seven factorial over five factorial. So between two n minus one and two n plus one, we figured out that 2n plus 1 was the larger um, factorial. It has more terms than the 2n minus 1 does. It's a bigger number being factor factorial. So if you write this number as itself and then write 1 less, well, what happens if I take away 1? I would just end up with 2n. What happens if I take away 1 again? I'm going to end up with 2n minus 1, which is exactly what you have in the numerator. So we just wrote it as 2n minus 1 factorial instead of trying to figure out the next one and the next one all the way down till I get to 1, okay? Which is very difficult to do when there's n's. You really don't ever expand it out until it gets to 1. You just expand it out enough until you can cancel the factorial. So the top factorial and the bottom factorial canceled. I ended up with this imaginary 1 in the numerator and a 2n plus 1 times a 2n in the denominator. Now, for example, three, it's a determine if the series converges or diverges. So essentially, all you're doing is finding the limit. And if the limit, um, if the limit equals zero, then um, we say here that um, this thing would um, diverge if it, no. It converges if it equals a number. 
So for instance, these two, we ended up getting a number. So this one would converge and we ended up getting one over here. So this one would converge. This one would be inconclusive. Um, so you would have to like apply some other test to see whether or not it converges or diverges because we talked about in the video that if you get zero, it's inconclusive, right? If you take the limit, um, it's inconclusive as to whether or not it will uh, converge, okay, or diverge. Now, um, okay, so for, we have to think about this, okay, because it's the debate, the words matter. So, if you have a series, and a series usually has a summation symbol. These problems do not have summation symbols. They're just giving me what a n is equivalent to. They're giving me the formula for each term in the sequence, not a series. So that divergence theorem that they talk about in 9.2 applies to series, not to sequences. So if you get the limit, equal to a number that is not zero, then, um, then we don't know if it converges or diverges. And if you get the limit, or no, I'm sorry. If you get the limit not equal to zero, then the series would diverge, okay? But if you take the limit and you get zero, then it's inconclusive, okay? But again, that is the rule for series not the same rule for sequences. For sequences, if the limit exists, it converges. And if the limit does not exist, then it diverges, okay? So since we took the limit here and we ended up with zero, we would say that this sequence converges. Same thing with number two, I'll go over how we found the limit. But if I take the limit of that one, I got three, which means the limit does exist. So this one converges. And then the same thing with this one, we did the limit, we found that we got one. And since the limit exists, it was converges. Now I talk about how in the video, I did another problem um, with it like this. And it might've had like, you know, n plus one over, or three n plus one over n minus two, something like that, okay? And when you take the limit of it, you get um, negative one over n times three, okay? Now, as you take the limit as n goes to infinity, this is gonna be two different values because if n is even, then negative one to an even exponent would be positive. And so your L would equal positive three. But if you take the limit and n is odd, then what ends up happening is that this stays as a negative and then your limit is negative three, okay? So it's both going to infinity, but depending on whether the power is odd or, e or even, it's gonna give you two different numbers. So this limit does not exist because for limits, you have to be getting to the same value in order for the limit to exist. And the fact that I'm getting two different values here, it means that the limit does not exist or you can just say L does not exist. L does not exist, okay? And because there's no limit, the limit does not exist, you would say that this one diverges, okay? So that's the rule for series. If you get a limit value, if the limit does exist, it converges. If you try to take the limit and it doesn't exist because you get two different values, um, or if you get infinity or negative infinity, that's the same thing. We also say does not exist, then it diverges, okay? But if you get an actual uh, finite number, then the limit does exist and it converges. So that's the rule for series, okay? Now, I did it two different ways. I did it by the old school method that they first teach you when you learn limits. And then I used L'Hopital's rule, which is the technique that you learned later in the chapters. So, Usually when you're going at this, you look at the denominator and you're finding the highest exponent of the denominator and then you're dividing each term by that. 
So between n and 6, the higher degree term is n. So I divided every term by n, but n divided by n was just 1. Okay. Then you take the limit as n goes to infinity. So this guy goes to 0, this guy goes to 0, and 0 over 1 is just 0. Now, if I applied L'Hopital's rule, the derivative of 2 is 0, the derivative of n plus 6 is 1, 0 over 1 is 0, and the limit of a constant is that same constant, 0. So whichever technique you used, you get the same zero limit. Now for part B, we did the same thing. So the first go round, we said, oh, between five and n squared, n squared is the higher degree term. So we divided every single term by n squared. So three n squared divided by n squared is just three. n squared divided by n squared is one. And then I have five over n squared. We take the limit as n goes to infinity. So this fraction goes to zero. You get three over one, which is just three. Um, similarly, if we apply L'Hopital's rule, we would get six n in the numerator, two n plus zero at the bottom. The n's would reduce, the six and two would reduce to a three, and the limit of a constant is that constant. And so again, we got a finite number, so the series converges. I'm sorry, the sequence converges. Then we moved on to this one. We said between two and this, this is the term with a higher degree. So we divided everybody by n to or the seventh root of n. So if I divide that by itself, I get one. If I divide this by itself, I get one. And then two divided by the seventh root of n just looks like two over the seventh root of n. As I take the limit as n goes to infinity, this fraction will go to zero. I get one over one, which is one. Now, if I applied L'Hopital's rule, remember this is n to the power one seventh. So I would get one seven in, take away one from the power, negative six seven. If I did the derivative at the bottom, I get the same thing plus zero. So anytime you have something over itself, it's just one. And the limit of a constant is that same constant. And so they all three of these converged. Now, Moving on to 9.2, 9.2 is where they start talking about series. So here's where they start adding the terms together, okay? Now, um, we don't have to determine whether the series converge or not because they literally tell us in both of these examples that these are convergent series. They just wanna know the sum, okay? So for the first example, these are both series that follow the geometric series pattern, okay? And in that pattern, you usually have your n going from zero to infinity, and then you have a coefficient, the base of your exponential, and then an exponent, okay? Now, as long as that base is less than one, the absolute value, so you're not worried about the sign of the base, just the number in the, in the base, but if that number in the base is less than one, um, then the series converges. If that radius, or it's literally called the radius, but if that um, r is greater than or even equal to one, then the series diverges, okay? Um, and so the idea here, The reason why they're both convergent series is because you notice this is three fourths as my base, which is less than one. If I ignore the sign, this is two thirds as my base and two thirds is less than one, okay? So both of these do converge. And it tells me what it converges to. It says for geometric series, they do converge to this sum, a over one minus r. So we just needed to identify the a coefficient and then the r base. So in this case, a is eight, and the base of the exponential is three fourths. So we do a minus, or eight over one minus three fourths. I typed that all in the calculator and got 32. Similarly over here, a is invisible, but it's a one, and the base is negative two thirds, okay? So you do look at the two thirds without the sign when you're deciding whether or not it converges but you are using the entire base as is, whether it's positive or negative, when you try to find the sum. So because my base is negative two thirds, I do have to use R equal to negative two thirds. I will get the wrong answer if I don't include the negative when I write down what R is. Then we do A over one minus R. 
this ends up becoming a plus sign, but I just typed that whole thing in the calculator and it gave me three fifths. Um, and then I did another one in case in the future when they ask me if the series converges or diverges. In this case, if I had this, um, my R, right, my radius or my, my base here is three and three is greater, greater than one, which is why the series diverges, okay? And then when they diverge, they don't ever ask you for the sum because it's usually infinity or negative infinity. In this case, it's positive or what is positive. Um, but that's essentially what um, they're doing. So I just wanted to give you an example of how you could tell if, if a geometric series diverges. Now, for example, two, it tells us that the two series are, are convergent series. So we know they converge, but they want to know what the sum is. And in order for us to find the sum, we basically have to take the limit of the partial sum up into the nth term. Okay. So if I can find an expression for the nth term, I can then take the limit of that as n goes to infinity, and that will give me the actual whole sum. Okay. And if we end up with a finite number, then it does converge. If we end up with infinity or negative infinity as the sum, then it diverges, okay? Um, but that will be later. That's called like the nth partial sum test or some, something like that. So I did have a problem like that kind of in the computer or in the video. So I think I was doing something like this. And so then I wrote out all the list of terms, and then we noticed that some of the terms canceled and some of them stuck. And we just simplified S in to only have the terms that didn't cancel. And then we took the limit of that uh, expression as n goes to infinity. So we're going to do the same thing here. But in order for me to tell if any of the terms cancel, we needed to break this up into partial fraction decomposition so that we could get one term minus the other term. Okay, and then we could see some of these terms canceling. So um, for the first thing, we set up the eight over n times n plus two, and um, I think for my notepad, there it is. Um, and then we would have some constant over n, some constant over n plus two. I multiplied all three fractions by n times n plus two. So they both cancel here, leaving me with eight. The n would cancel, leaving me with a times n plus two. And the n plus two would cancel, leaving me with b times n. So I distributed my a and I got a n plus two a and I brought down the plus b n. Um, so I have terms for n, I have a plus b, but there's no nth term over here. So the coefficient would just be zero. And then for the constant term, I have 2a, which for the constant term on this side equals 8. So if I divide both sides by 2, I get a equals 4. And if I plug that back into here, 4 plus negative 4 equals 0. So that means that b would have to be negative 4. So then I rewrote my series. Um, instead of writing the summation of this, I wrote the summation of what it's equivalent to, right? Because this equals this. So a was 4 and b was negative 4. So instead of plus a negative four, I just did minus four. Um, and then what we're doing is we're replacing the n with numbers from one to infinity, but we're only gonna be finding the partial sum, not the whole entire sum all the way to infinity, okay? Um, we'll find the whole entire sum when we actually take the limit of the partial sum. So we're just doing the partial sum. So at first I let n equal, um, in plus, I let n equal one. So I replaced this n with the one, I replaced that n with the one, which made it three. Then I did for n equal to two, so that became a two, two plus two was four. n was equal to three, so I got a three, and then three plus two is five. Um, and I could have kept going, like I would have done for n equal to four. Um, and let me do that. So if I would have done n equal to four, I would have gotten um, four over four minus four over six. Then if I had done n equal to five, 
I would have got four over five minus four over seven, et cetera, et cetera. And so then you notice that the negative four thirds and the positive four thirds wiped each other out. The negative four and this negative four would have wiped each other out. Um, and then this positive four fifths would have wiped out that negative four fifths, okay? And all the other ones are gonna eventually happen as well. Um, so these would have canceled out as well. Um, then what I did was I tried to go backwards. So I wanted to do n, n minus one, n minus two. I could have even done n minus three and n minus four, just so you could see the patterns. So if I replace that with n minus four, it would be four over n minus four. And then n minus four plus two would have been n minus two. And then if I would have done n minus three, I would have got four over n minus three minus four over n minus three plus two would have been n minus one. And so what ends up happening is that this n minus two would have canceled with one two terms before it. Um, this n cancels with this four over n, right? P negative and positive. This four n minus one would have canceled with this negative four n minus one um, and so on and so forth. But the thing is, is that there wasn't any term after this to cancel out the n plus one. And there's no terms after this one to cancel with the n plus two. And these two guys never canceled either. So when you write the sum, you're just gonna write this term, which is four, this term, which is, I could have reduced it to two, but I left it as four over two. Then I still have that term and I still have this term, okay? And so the terms do eventually cancel. Now, um, when I do this together, we when I take the limit of this um, partial sum expression, um, the denominator will go to infinity, which means the fraction goes to zero. Here, the denominator will go to infinity, which means the whole fraction goes to zero. So you end up with the limit of these constants, which are just those constants themselves. The limit value is those constants themselves. So four plus this weird little two is going to be six. So my final sum there would be six. Now we're going to do similarly the same thing for the other example, part B. Um, so I just rewrote the whole thing here. And um, we did factor it. So when we factored it, we got 3n minus 1 and 3n plus 2. Um, and then we did the partial. Since this is linear, it's going to be a constant. Linear, it's going to be a constant. And then I multiplied both sides of the equation by 3n minus 1, 3n plus 2. That canceled here. We left with 8, a times 3n plus 2, and b times 3n minus 1. I distributed the A and I distributed the B. And then since there were no Ns over here, this 3A plus this 3B coefficient would just be zero. And then this 2A minus B should equal this constant eight. And so instead of using the calculator, I just did elimination method real quick. So I multiplied by three. I wrote this equation again. So it's just a repeat. And here, when I multiply by 3, I get 6a, negative 3b, and 24. These cancel, leaving me with 9a equal to 24. I divide both sides by 9, and then I reduce that fraction, and I got 8 over 3. Then I plug this into the top equation. So 3 times the 8 over 3 I found for a, plus 3b equal to 0. 3s cancel, I get 8. I moved over the 8, and then I divided by the 3, and I got negative eight-thirds for b. So the fraction can be rewritten with a over the 3n minus 1. And because of the negative, it'll be minus 8 over 3 over 3n plus 2. Now for me to find that partial sum, I started using the n values, right? So here I plugged in 1. I plugged in 1 for n. That's 3 minus 1, which is 2. 3 times 1 is 3, plus 2 is 5. Here I did two, so it's six minus one, which is five. That's six plus two, which is eight. I plugged in three, nine minus one is eight. Um, nine plus two is 11. And I kept dot, 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 right? If I would have kept going, it's fine. Then I have to plug in n minus two. 
So if I do n minus two, it's three n, three times n minus two. So three times n is three n, three times minus two is minus six. And with this minus one makes minus seven. Three times n is, is three n, three times minus two is negative six, plus two gives me a negative four. Now when we do n minus one, um, I did that one here. So three times n minus one minus one, you distribute negative three and negative one make negative four, which is what I've got there. And when I plug in n mi minus one again, we get negative three plus two, which is negative one. And so I've got that there. And when you plug in n, you're replacing n with n. So it's just eight thirds over this minus eight thirds over three n plus two. Then we notice what's canceling. It's like the back-to-back -back terms are canceling. So these two terms back-to-back -back cancel, those two terms back-to-back -back cancel. This one would have canceled with the next, the first term in the next value. Um, and then the same thing here, the last guy would have canceled with this one. These two are back-to-back, -back, they cancel. These two are back-to-back, -back, they cancel, right? One negative, one positive. So really all we're left with is the first term and minus the last term. So when you take the limit, of those two terms as n goes to infinity. Um, this n goes to infinity, this denominator goes to infinity, which means the whole fraction goes to zero. Any constant over infinity will go to zero. So then you end up just with this value here, 8 thirds over 2, which I put in the calculator and it gave me 4 thirds. And so now I know the sum of that particular problem. Okay. But that's all we covered today. Um, someone also did mention that um, the videos were wrong in the 9.3 and 9.4 discussions. So I did go ahead and fix those videos. So they should be good and ready to go. So make sure you do watch those videos before class um, because there's four different tests that are gonna get discussed in those two sections and we're gonna be practicing them. So even though we didn't use all of our class time today, we will definitely use all of our class time in the next class period, because we'll be learning the P-series, the integrals uh, test, both of those tests in 9.3. And then in 9.4, you're gonna be using the comparison test. Um, there's a direct comparison test, and then there's the limit comparison test. So it, these two top parts are for the direct comparison, and then the bottom one is for the limit comparison. Um, and so we will talk about those four different kinds of tests in the next class, okay? Um, other than that, I think we are good. And if you come up with any questions between now and the next time I see you, always message me using the Remind app, or if you've gotten a text message from me, to your cell phone, by dark, to your direct messages, um, you can reply to that direct message. Like when I send an announcement, if you reply to that announcement in your direct messages, it goes through Remind and it sends me your message. Um, but some of y'all actually have the Remind app installed on your cell phones. And so in those cases, you can also contact me through inside the app. Um, but other than that, you guys have a good day. It's Halloween. So have a happy Halloween, and I will see you all on Wednesday.